doing? Steve Witt here. We've got oh, a full team this week. We've got me and, of course, Ashley Brogan. Your faithful co-host, yes. And we me. have a special <laughs> guest, first ever, not really. Not but really. Let's just <laughs> Recurring like guest. It. Jay Brogan. Jay Brogan. Hello. Hello, everybody. Hello. We really dragged him in because Ashley didn't read the required <laughs> things this week. Thank, so thank you for we need a little deeper throwing well. Throwing me under the bus. Well, I'm not, no, I just you know want full accountability here. I'm up to date and, and ahead, actually. But and Ashley, Jay is 60 days ahead, so he's at, making yeah, up Yeah, so both. the guys are winning right now. <laughs> I, and if you're... Anyway, I don't want to get involved on that. It sounds very fleshly. But anyway... <laughs> Back to scripture. So I want to go back to May 16th, and I'm reading out of the Bible, of course, mm. but it's a different setup for this day. So it might be a little bit overlap from the previous week. I just want to mention about Saul, though, and 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 the the band of uh, worshipers that came down off the mountain. Did you talk about that last week? No, last, no, we last didn't, week we, we had, had Tommy Zito on. Yes. So we missed that. So I want to touch on it because it's so important. The power of a worshiping community, and it's in 1 Samuel 18. Remember, it says David went out wherever Saul sent him and behaved wisely. So David is in this place where it's a a love-hate relationship between him and Saul. And he's out there, and Saul sent him over an army of war and so forth and blah, blah. And then it happens as they were coming home when David was returning from the slaughter of the Philistines. He's always slaughtering those Philistines. That the women had come out of all the cities and they were singing and dancing uh, to meet King Saul with tambourines and joy and musical instruments. But they say something that causes a huge controversy in the heart, basically, of Saul. And they said, Saul has slain his thousands. He probably was excited to hear that. But then he heard them singing, David has killed his ten thousands. Why do you think that was such a big deal? It was a big deal to Saul. Because Saul had a pride issue. Yeah, the next verse says he was very angry. Uh, yeah, he, he was, was very, very he was very upset. Uh, I think we talked uh, two weeks ago. We were talking about the difference between Saul and Moses because both of them kind of had Saul similar. Was it Saul and Moses or Saul and David? Well, we talked about both. Okay, it was well, initially with it. Saul and uh, Moses because Saul and Moses had similar responses when the Lord kind of called them more like, oh, who am I? Yeah, I'm the least of the me? least. I'm the least of the Hiding least. In the coke and they were. Yeah, yeah, yeah they and, both and did. And they were. <laughs> and they both, but they both responded that way, but both had very different kind of trajectories of their life and how everything turned out. And so I asked the question of what made them. And Saul was probably taller. Yeah, but I mean, asked the he question of tall, what's the hair. difference between the two? Like, why did one succeed and one failed when they both started kind of in, from the same place of humility? Humility. And Jay pointed out how one feared the Lord and mm. one feared man. And so I think that when you fear man, as Saul did, it creates a whole slew of insecurities inside of yourself. Well, there's insecurities probably already there. And this is like pushing yes. on that. Where, the whereas, the yeah, whereas mm-hmm. Moses yeah. raising mm-hmm. up Joshua brought him with him on the journeys, showed him, had him standing at the door of the tabernacle. Yeah, that's a good comparison. And then Saul with having David, who's who's kind of like, you know, the Lord's... You know, he's not quite I mean, yet the, the Lord's anointed, God's but the him, favor though. of Everybody the Lord is on it. him. And so maybe when you fear man, your ability to kind of raise someone up with well, you changes. Well, you wonder if this is a legacy illustration. Oh, yeah. So especially today in the churches across America, we're in a big legacy shift mm-hmm. right now. Baby boomers are getting a little too old. Yep. But they're still holding on to their churches. Yeah. And releasing to the next generation in some cases that is millennials or what's the next one after Gen that? Z. Gen, Gen Z. Z. Yeah, we're skipping a generation yeah. in some cases, you know, to go younger. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so we're seeing that dynamic where churches are having a very difficult time with this. I think it's yeah. something that applies today. And it, there's a there's a responsibility for the Davids and the Sauls or the Joshuas and the Moseses. In the case of Moses and Joshua, it feels like a true sonship there. Yeah, like like Moses was bringing. I I think Josh was one of the ones who true. went up the mountain when Moses right. went to they encounter the Lord. He took him right into the he inner had place. Josh at the door of the tabernacle. So when he went into the holy of holies, Josh was waiting at the door. So there was like a lot of kind of the the partnership, and it seemed like a a healthy dynamic in passing it off to the next generation. And for Saul, I think he just 
his fear of man created insecurities within himself that made him not able to celebrate David, no, whereas a true father would celebrate the victories of his son. Not that he was his yes. father, but this you whole know. passage all through it. I mean, it's him getting upset and trying yeah. to kill David, you know, and, and you can see he's really torn within himself. Even in some of the reading for this week, you can see with him responding like, oh, David, like my my, what did he say in one of the he scriptures? He's really double-minded, like, like he's going back and forth. Yeah, very double-minded. You know, it makes me think of this quote I heard. I think it was Stephanie Gretzinger said it. She said, when you don't fear God, you fear everything else. Ooh, that's and good. It, and it kind of seems like that's what we're seeing here. Oh, Steph, we miss her. Like, and I, one of the things, Steve, you're probably going to get to this, <laughs> but back, I notice so. it's funny. Come back. So Paul has a pride attack. He has attack of the insecurities. Mm -hmm. and he gets really nervous. And it's the very next verse in verse 10, it says the next day. A tormenting spirit from okay. God. Yeah, yeah, yes. yeah. So, so wait. Yeah. I was going to talk about that. Yeah. Go so ahead. this is God's fault. Is it God? Well, it says God sent. Somebody a tormenting said spirit. on the podcast wait, this does week. Does God do that? Because it says right well, there. He yeah, just sent it. It's what it says in Scripture. Yeah. It's right there. Can I bring this up because this is a question that we received in sure. the group that we didn't answer that somebody wanted to know from First Samuel eighteen ten. So this would have been last week's reading. Yep. Um, that it said the next day, a harmful spirit from God rushed upon Saul and he raved within his house while David was playing the lyre as he did by day. Saul had his spear in his hand. Why would an evil spirit come from God? He raved like a madman though. But it yeah, say, but it, it says a tormenting spirit. Does it say the evil next day, spirit? a harmful spirit from God? Well, yeah, it does say evil spirit in the notes here. Does God have distressing spirits he uses? I think it's a really interesting point because... Or do you think it's like he's lifting his hand of restraint and allowing something to come? I I think... It says from God, though. I know, but I think I think Saul invited it, you know, with his... Open doors with his in his heart, life. it opened... I, I think there's something in this. Of course, we're New Testament, but I think there's something in this. When you get something in your heart that you... It's beyond just being wounded. Now you've created a wounded culture. You're upset. Every time you see this person at church or at work or whatever, it's like, oh, I hate that person. Yeah. I don't want to be around them. When that happens, something opens up in your spirit that can bring distress. I also wonder, the really, the crux of all of this is the difference between the fear of the Lord and the fear of man and how crucial the fear of the Lord is in our lives as believers. Because when you don't fear him, it can just open up your life to distress yeah. And, and insecurity. And Saul and, follows in that throughout yes. this whole narrative. Yeah. It's not like he has a good day. I and he, feel like it's a key to something. So it's like what you choose to believe invites the reality of a kingdom to manifest in your life. You know, oh, what yeah. you choose to align your thoughts and, and your approach to life invites the participation from one kingdom or the other. This is not dissimilar to hardening the heart of Pharaoh. That's true. Yeah. You know, That's a great you know point. it's almost like God, when he sees, he knows all, when he sees a heart that is not returning. Like he knows that this heart's not That he then to uses him. that heart for, for the his purposes purpose. of God. Yeah. So he's doing something right now in Saul. He's bringing him to a point, but Saul is already there, really. Yeah. Otherwise, I don't think what God would What was the turning point, point for Saul? Was it, was it the raising up of, da of David? Like I think the turning point for Saul because he was really loved David. The first day he performed the priestly duties, I think it goes all oh, the way back. Oh yeah, yeah, I think yeah. It goes all the way back when he then. compromised with not sacrificing he was the people he was supposed to. He was to. waiting for Samuel to come, and so he performed the priesthood because of the pressure of the people. And he stepped out of kingship into priesthood that was unauthorized. And I think that that was mm, the turning good. point. And that's when the 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 tear happened. He said, "The kingdom's torn from you today." Oh, yeah, that's but this right. is like the fruiting of it. Because now the it's it's reached out into the culture, and the women are singing, you know, David. Saul's well, killed his thousands. Well, also David's though, he was probably like a young, you know, he was a young bear killer, lion killer, giant slayer guy. <laughs> You're looking at ancient. He kind of came in. All the too. girls were probably like, "Ooh, David." <laughs> yeah, but Saul was taller. He was above head and shoulders above all the men. Yeah, David, but, but David he had, but was he had a, unlike anyone. But David, but his short ego. He yeah. had a short ego. Yeah. David apparently was shorter, yeah. smaller, ruddy, handsome. Yeah. But had a bigger faith component. You might even say a bigger ego. Yeah. He, you know, yeah, he was willing to say, he was willing to give his his credentials. I yeah. killed the bear. I killed the lion. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I can go after this giant. Yeah. Who does that? David's really fast. A little guy uh, that's out with the sheep in the field. You know. Yeah. The Bible even says he had he has. He says he has small hands. 
Really? Yeah. <laughs> it's funny because the, the chosen when they, <laughs> yes. on the TV show, the Cho- chosen when they show David, they do these little flashbacks of there are a couple times where he's on there. And I look at who they cast, and I'm like, they cast a, like a little twerp guy. <laughs> like, what? Nerd. <laughs> that's not what IT. I imagined David to be. But when you're saying this, it seems like that's possibly how he was. Was but like you know, a little. Dave, David had isolation, right? He was out in the field, so he didn't have exposure to maybe all the other uh, connections or things that his brother had. And something about being alone with God actually set him, uh, calibrate his heart to the reality of heaven. I think more than people in the hustle and the bustle. It's like so when he walked into the battle he had a different, more real perspective of who God was that trumped the reality of like yeah. Goliath and all the crazy stuff. So like Saul was intimidated by the giants and, and the other things. David was invigorated by it. Well, this was definitely yeah. a flashpoint. Something about the, when the PR came out, it yeah. disturbed He him, didn't like it. You know, and so he, uh, this happens today in the church. It definitely happens in the world, you know, where where you see somebody promoted above you and you're like, wait, well, I, I've been here 10 years. That guy's only been here like two years. Yeah. What's going on? I mean, it. you can't rejoice in another person's promotion because you're constantly in our culture now. We compare everything to ourselves. You probably know that, Jay, from being in the, uh, you know, involved in music aspect, worship, uh, writing songs, songs that are getting published. I mean, there's there's a lot of dynamic in the worship community about this, I mean, there's like a an echelon, a chain. Mm-hmm. It, it's true with everybody. Yeah, it's the sp- spirit of the world that slips into the church. You know, I got a book published, therefore I'm kind of you know I I've got a book published. Oh, you don't have a book published. I mean, it's just all this stuff that has come in to infiltrate the church and actually take us away from the sacrificial life and the life of rejoicing that that Jesus talks about, where we can rejoice in another man's blessing. Yeah. yeah. What do you think about that? I mean, we're seeing it in music culture, and we don't know all the behind the scenes. I but think in a super me centric world that we're living in and culture we're living in, it's become very difficult for people to celebrate. Yes. And to e- and to feel very easily like intimidated well, you know, by other people. The simple fact is that when people are really concerned about maintaining their place, as far as like you know notoriety, a celebrity type thing, they've lost sight of who they are in Christ. Just bottom line. Yeah. You're grasping at something to try to fill a void or to feel validated or to feel some kind of security outside of the Lord. And that always ends in the same place it lets all. Well, this Sunday, a, a guy shows up in a Bentley, which is about a quarter of a million dollar car. And it's sitting right out near the spot where I normally park. Uh-oh. There were actually people that thought that was my car. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> so they came up. Now, here's the response. I was we're really proud. That would have been exciting. These young guys, like in their, <laughs> they were around 30-ish, these guys came up to me and they said, oh, did you, is that your car? And I and I not know what they're talking about. I hadn't seen the Bentley because I've been in the church all morning. Yeah. And I said, oh, what, are, what are you talking about? So he's, he's all, you know, so we walked out and there's this Bentley sitting there and he says, is that your car? I said, no, that's not my car. So you think that was my car? I drive at the church. <laughs> no, that's not my car. I wish it was. But anyway, I said, let's go over and look at it. And they were like afraid to go over there and look into it because someone might think they're breaking in or something. And I said, no. So we started laughing and talking about it, but they were excited about it. They said, oh man, we were in church this morning talking about, wow, Pastor Steve's got a Bentley. They were excited about it. Yeah. That part I thought, well, that's a pure heart. Yeah. Because a lot of people would see that and go, is that Pastor we Steve? That's too never, much. <laughs> yeah, we're paying him yeah, too much. Something yeah. is wrong, you know, but it, it uh, thankfully it yeah, wasn't. People are, yeah. It was mm-hmm. an 07 Bentley. <laughs> well, people kind of oh, believe that you're huge. less spiritual if you have a nice car. Maybe you had like a, a mess up car. That would be better. Yeah, well, I know. A friend of mine has a Rolls Royce. I borrowed it for a wedding, my son's wedding two years ago. I drive up in my driveway. Neighbors start, yeah. you know, they look, we're pretty close community. Yeah. They come over and like, oh, hey. I said, oh, no, 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 it's not my car. It's a friend of mine. They're like, oh, yeah. okay. You know, and then they get, they rejoice with you. You know, yeah. it's a great oh, car. Oh, it's cool to pretend so, yeah. to use it. <laughs> if it was my car, <laughs> where are you moving? You know, you've yeah. got to be uh, probably getting out of this neighborhood. So <laughs> I just feel like yeah. we face that all the time yeah. in Christian culture. Maybe more than we ever have. I don't know. But I I really feel that we have to wrestle that. We, you know, love overwhelms overcomes you've got to rejoice if you don't somehow there's an opening that can come into you of of uh jealousy mm-hmm. uh, wow and like you just said that invites, covetousness that can uh, invite a tormenting spirit just like for saul like is, i don't know how that works in the new testament you know? but i there is something that you're tormented by another person's blessing you, you know it makes me think like this i had this thought once 
um, the things that go through our mind, our thoughts are like a fragrance that attract uh, the manifestation of one kingdom or the other. So like if you have stinky thoughts, it attracts the bugs. Yeah. Oh, yeah. There you go. <laughs> yes. Yeah. There's flies find. Uh... <laughs> yes. <laughs> anyway. Yeah, yeah. So going on. I think there's enough lessons for there. Yes, Let's go yes. on here. Can we go to. Oh, we didn't um, talk about how Saul pinned him. To the, we'll try to pin him to the wall, though. Yeah, there was that. That, that Can we <laughs> talk about Saul? That was why he was singing and playing his instrument, wasn't it? Or? Yeah, well, he was playing it and giving him like peace. And he's like, oh, this is such great music. Then it's like he wakes up and he's like, <gasps> it's like he, he, he was, to David's he credit, was he did leave. He did. He, he ran out. He didn't say, he didn't think, oh, he's I mean, just having I'll a bad day. He did dodge Somebody the spear, was standing though, there playing still. the lyre while I was trying to sleep. I might not have a very different reaction. <laughs> but didn't he throw it to his son also <laughs> later on? He did throw it to Jonathan when, when well, Jonathan helped David escape. He's like... Yeah, so he's got issues. He's got a... That he, is he's true, tormented. Yeah. It's, it's, and even his daughter, he got upset at her that she leaked information uh, from the throne room and yeah. David he's, escaped. Although they put David in a bed with a uh, a head melon with goat's head on it or, mm-hmm. or goat's hair did on it. Did they really? It's like so God yeah, so the, and so they invited the them in to see, see David sick see, and be quiet. And they said, well, you know, and they go over there, I'm here to kill him. They pull the covers back and they realize, and he turns, Saul turns to, what was it, Micah, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Turns to Micah and says, you know, what, what are you doing? You know, you're betraying me. Is it Michael? Mike, Michael. Michael. Yeah, Michael. Michael. Yeah, Michael, whatever. whatever. Michael. Strange name. <laughs> M-I-C-A-L. 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 But can we, can we talk for a second about the first time that um, David spares Saul's life? This is in the first day of the reading that we did, and cuts the corner of the. Uh, yes. Mm-hmm. So he. So Saul goes Saul, into a cave to relieve himself. Yeah. So Saul. We don't know what that means. He's trying to find David. David's hiding. He goes into a cave, and David is actually in the cave. So then, all of his friends are his friends. His mighty men are like, this "You got this is the time to out. kill him." And so then he, he goes. I got to say, I'd probably told him the same thing. But I think what's yeah, interesting. Right? I, Ow. See, and and I said, listen, we talked about the last podcast that yes. we want to start counting how many times we use the word interesting. <laughs> and then we started listening to the that podcast. We and know. we know. We need to get a list, <laughs> of, uh, a list of synonyms, synonyms for interesting. <laughs> interesting. I was so what I thought was really fascinating Amazing. about this portion <laughs> of scripture is uh, first of all, David's response is to the conviction of the Holy Spirit, that the Holy Spirit kind of convicts him. And he says, I can't touch the Lord's anointed. Since the Holy Spirit smote his heart, I think is one translation. Is that what says. one of the, one well, that's think, nice. Yeah. Um, but he responds, how he responds to the conviction of the Lord is something that we can learn. And also it's interesting. Oh, see, when he cut the thing and Saul turns around, Saul goes, is that really you, my son David? Like I feel like he, he, he kind of has cave, this though. like like a flash of... multi personality yes. situation going on, where he's like, Wait, are, "Oh, David, my say? son." He's, he's um, bipolar. No, he's fractured. Fractured. I mean, oh, well, that fractured, makes sense yeah. though, because he was demonized. I mean, a spirit, an evil spirit, yeah. whatever it was, came and tormented him, and he was raving like a madman. That's not mm. a mentally well person. Yeah, and I think it, he just he said, "Is this you?" And he he said. You're a better man than I am because I would have repaid. And he prophesies. Me, he? good for evil. Yeah, but yeah, he yeah, says yeah. to him, About may the kingdom. Lord reward yeah. you well for your kindness you have shown to me. And now I realize that you are surely going to be the king. So he blesses and, and prophesies over And him. that the kingdom of Israel will flourish. Bum, bum, we bum, love that word. Under your rule. It's like this moment flourish. of David responding uh, to the conviction of the Holy Spirit somehow triggered Saul to realize my time here is limited. Well, I mean, that's also, kind of, I mean, think about that, him stepping out and calling Saul out. I mean, that was a risk. Didn't Saul have a guard? They could have shot him like then and there. And we're talking. But it happens again. Yeah. It happens a couple so, of chapters later. I mean, Saul's like, this is not a full repentance or something. He's getting a flash of sorrow about his life. It's like, it's like the alcoholic yeah. or the drug addict that I'm free. I'm not going to take it anymore. And you know, and then, Two days later, they're back on it. You know, he makes David it. promise that you'll take care of my household. Yeah, he's when seeing into over. the future. He is. He's having a wow. a prophetic moment or something. Yeah, yeah. Even you when think, you're tormented, you can still. <laughs> do you think that that piece of Saul, that like that kind of like shred of light right there, is uh, realized in Mephibosheth? Because that was one of Saul's descendants mm-hmm. that made it. What do you mean? It was a 
He was a nephew, wasn't he? It was Jonathan's son. Jonathan's son. Jonathan, that's right, Jonathan. Yeah, they were running to his grandson. Mephibosheth fell, fractured his legs, couldn't walk. Five like, years old. Yeah. And uh, David spared his life and gave him a seat at the king's table to eat there. So I'm wondering, that sh- that kind of glimmer of who Saul was that would come out from time to time, did spared the Lord honor that and life? spare Mephibosheth down the road? I don't know. Maybe that's possible. That's interesting. Yeah. Well, There's hey, you want to keep talking about Saul? I mean, I got. I do. Got some... Wait, I do have more. I have more. I did some of the reading Cause this that, week because you know we had some. <laughs> some we had some complaints. I, I think behind. that we or Spent suggestions too much time that we don't go Testament. to the New Testament. It's okay if we talk about Jesus, yes. you know, rather than Saul. Mm-hmm. And we'll get back to Saul because I do have some stuff on the Witch of Endor Ooh. that I want to talk about. Okay. Some big things that you need to help us solve that are interesting. All right. So um, <laughs> anyway, Jesus. Uh, confronts the Jews and tells them, again, I love this. Every time I see this, I want to say it publicly. Jesus says things that culturally are offensive today. So he says, they're talking about how they're sons of Abraham, you know, and he has this debate with them and they're debating back why they're, why they're Abraham's sons. And he says, you are of your father, the devil. And the desires of your father, you want to do. So he's telling them, he's saying, you, you are sons and daughters of the devil, and you're actually wanting to do what he does. He said this to the Pharisees? Uh, it says to the Jews, I don't, I, you oh. know, I was looking to see, I think it infers that it was the religious elite that were there. I couldn't find Pharisees. It's sons and daughters of Abraham, though. And he says this, and then he says, he was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there's no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources, for he is a liar and the father of it. Because I tell you the truth, you do not believe in me, which of, of you convicts me of sin. If I tell you the truth and you do not believe me, he who is of God hears God's words. Therefore, you do not hear because you are not of God. Man, that just, I had to stop and read that over and over and thought, that's like seething. It's it's hot, man. That's it's, an intense thing. Yeah, it's intense. I mean, and, and it said, then the Jews said to him, do we not say rightly that you are a Samaritan and have a demon? So they're saying he has a demon. He's saying your son's a devil. What's worse? That's well, quite the debate. <laughs> <laughs> but here's the, here's the way it ends. And this one, because I, I saw this several times in my reading recently that I haven't noticed before. How many times do you, they threaten to kill Jesus? So here it is again. They said, then they took up stones to throw at him, but Jesus hid himself. Oh, he like disappeared into the crowd. This happens a couple times. Uh, Yeah, it does. That he hid himself and went out of the temple going through the midst of them. So he went, he he turned invisible or something Something. and went through the midst of the crowd and so passed by. That's why. Do you think the Lord just paused time for a second there so he could? You mean stop the frame? Yeah, and like, Jesus like pause, through. and then Jesus kind of kept walking, and then there are pause. movies like that. <laughs> I like the idea of the invisible thing too. I think that's pretty. I do cool. think yeah, it's where interesting. Is he? Where is he? Excuse me. Excuse the chosen me. <laughs> did this, did portray this uh, in the scene where he says, "Yeah, I remember um, that now." You know, I'm not welcome in my hometown. Kind of thing. They were going to throw, throw him over a cliff, and it kind of has everybody who was going to. He turned around and said, "Not it's like today." They pause and they can't see him, and they just kind of like all kind of pause still. I'd like to ask a question real quick. He's telling them, Steve, he's talking about how you're of your father, the devil, and they're saying that he's basically performing miracles through Satan, the power of Satan, right? right? How, doesn't that kind of And he has a it? demon. So isn't that like really flirting with blasphemy, blaspheming the Holy well, Spirit? it is blasphemy. It's blasphemy, blasphemy yes. the Holy Spirit, though, attributing the works of the Lord. Oh, to, yes. This is an important to, thing. Yeah. You need to be careful when you see somebody calling what they're doing works of the devil. Yeah, because we were sitting we, with, learned, we were sitting with somebody a couple yeah. weeks ago who was uh, pointing out a specific ministry and they were saying that um, I, my group of leaders and people who we work with say that this group isn't even a real church. You know, God, the Holy Spirit's not moving there. And I had to pause them and say, that's some really frightening things to say. Well, yeah, and what do you base that on? Like, I, yeah. you know, I was with a Catholic coalition, a small confab in the Vatican two weeks ago. We're talking about that. And I got to say, with the Catholics, I'm just telling you by the people I've been involved with, it's not, I'm sure there's bad Catholics, just like there's bad <laughs> Pentecostals and Charismatics, you know. But uh, they judge they judge people by fruit in their lives, fruit of the Spirit. Mm-hmm. And they judge people by 
uh, kind of orthodoxy, like how does this align with Christ? Mm. How does this align through God with Scripture? So if they're saying that about people that are doing miracles and healing, quote unquote, healing the sick, you know, and all that, that's very risky, particularly when evangelicals uh, slam Charismatics, Pentecostals or whatever for attempting to follow what Jesus said to do. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and then calling that, that that's not of God. Also, who were the people that um, did that? Or that was it the Pharisees, the religious people? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. But, but I mean, that, that is, it, we have the old, age old definition that blasphemy is attributing to uh, Satan uh, what are actually what are, the works right. of God. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so you have to be careful because you don't think you're dancing. I'm not saying it's blasphemous, but you can see it from there. But I mean, I sit, it. Yeah, it if is. I go on social media, I see reels that show up of, you know, videos of Bethel Redding or different movements that we know. Or respected people where, who are manifesting the spirit that we know. Yeah. Yeah. There's, like, there's one out there about someone we really love dearly where people are just mocking and making fun of what the Lord is doing in her life. And we're just like, I mean, these people, <laughs> they better be so careful because of what the Lord said when you like, you're, you're attributing what I'm doing to works of the devil. You're blaspheming the Holy Spirit. Like, well, is there, is there any time in scripture where the Lord rebukes those who are attempting to do what he is doing? He is sick. Raise the dead, whatever. Actually, the opposite. I mean, maybe the disciples, because they were upset that there was others healing in Jesus' name, and he said, who's not for you? Who's not that's, against that's you? Right. for you? That's right. That was that was really good, Jay. Yeah, yeah and also the, <laughs> so sons, the, disciples were the, ones. the sons of Sceva, <laughs> yeah. who were trying to do it without the power of Jesus, uh-huh. yeah. and they got jumped on by a bunch of demons. So there's all kinds of little mixtures in there, but the safe side of things is what Jesus did, we do. We we live our lives according to that. Not just the gifts that Jesus had, the fruit, right? His life, the love, the you know, you can move in the spirit, the Bible says, and have not love and you have nothing. So so I just think it's, you know, we don't want to stand, spend too much time on this, but gotta be careful. No, you really do have to be careful. And even even Pentecostals and Charismatics have to be careful as they judge, you know, well, they don't have the spirit. Everyone born of God is born of the spirit. Come on. They really are. But are they moving into things of the spirit? I, I mean, I just told someone the other day, maybe it was the church. I don't know. I said, in reality, I think we are moving in 1% of the power that's been given to us as a church in America. And then if we increase, if we really begin to believe God and we begin to fast, we spend time in his word, there's going to be something coming out of our hearts as we're planted in a place of peace. I mean, think about it. Are the Christians, you know, the most peaceful people, you know? No. No, I mean, no they I should be. Too fast. Are they the most joyful? <laughs> yeah, that was a little quick. Little I'd like to say that they are. Sorry, healing. I mean, I'd like to say that they're the most no. joyful, but a lot of times there's not much difference between people in the world and the church. Sometimes, I mean, you go yeah, on and social actually, people in the world say you can't find. Well, it. people are not friendly at the church. They're not, you know. Yeah. And part of yeah. me is like, oh, it's kind of true because, but it's because there's people in the church that are coming out of the world, and they're still, you know, they're they're in process. Let's say they're in process. So we got to give mercy to that. And grace, I mean, when you think about it, they go, oh, the church is just a bunch of broken people. Of course it is. Yes. And as it should be, you know, <laughs> Jesus said, I didn't come for those who are whole. Right. I came for those who needed healing. Yeah. Yep. They need the physician. Like a doctor goes to the ones that are yeah. sick. So, so we're on, we're standing on good ground. It's okay in the church. But when I talk about the fruit, when I talk about people that have been in Christ 5, 10, 15, 20 years, we should be seeing the most joyful I know this sounds judgmental, but it's just the, it's the measure of the spirit. Most joyful, peaceful, loving people on earth should be those who are mature in Christ. Right. But the metric most people and use crickets. is, <laughs> well, the metric most people use though, is they're like, especially the people who kind of question when the Lord's moving, they're like, you're operating in the power. It's all about the power. But if you look at Jesus, he, op- he performed miracles out of compassion. It's like a fundamental misunderstanding of why he releases the kingdom into the earth. He was moved by compassion. He wasn't here to show off. He, he didn't need to prove something to <laughs> no. us, you know, or to show how great he was. Anyway, Jesus yeah. and the Jesus. attempts to try to kill him are fascinating. And we did talk about Jesus in the New Testament, but our time is short. You know, we're not Joe Rogan. We can't go for three hours oh, come on. on our Maybe podcast. One day. But I do want to talk. Can we go back now to the Old Testament again? Yes. Uh, we, so we I talk about the cave. There. I do too. Okay. A couple things. Who's, like, who's comes first? 
in the order of scripture. Do I need to reference Elders. This? Which cave? Your elders. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, just the cave <laughs> of Adullam. We were talking about that. Adullam. Yes. Oh, yes. yes. Okay, that's before mine. So David's hiding there, and it says uh, there was a gathering. This is like a church split. Oh, you know, where people are going down together, and there's a gathering of people. The Bible, fortunately, in, in the translation, they all start with D, which makes it very easy to preach from. Oh, good. But anyway, it says everyone who was in distress, everyone who was in debt, and everyone who was discontented, discontented. Yep. gathered to him. Does that sound like a church plant to you? <laughs> just gonna it say. sounds like one after they've left the church split. <laughs> well, yeah, it is. It is. That's, where, that's where church plants start. Church, plant. church plants start with a lot the, of burnout Christians, you know, yeah, we're like, oh my God. And so, but, but he created, what were they called? Mighty men. The mighty men. Yeah. How many of them were there? 200. It's a little test. Hundreds. 300, 400. 200. And that's that 200 mighty men? Four, I mean, these are the people who had like no. a sword fused in their hand because of how many Okay, yeah, let me out. solve that problem. And so he became captain over them, and there were about 400 So, men like with I him. said, you're thinking of getting 300 times. I was right. I said hundreds. Times two. 400. I said 400. <laughs> so, the, so there's 400. You say, I wouldn't want to pastor that group. Well, David did, and he was a shepherd. He said, distress, the debt, the discontented. He forged Anyone mighty men out of that. Who could fight with a weapon in each hand? Come on, that's cool. So when you look at your church, you go, "Oh, Lord, send me better people. People are all put together." You know, it's no; these are the people you want. Yeah. Did, didn't some of those guys too go on to slay uh, giants too? Like I, I think one of the mighty men killed Goliath's brother too down the road. <gasps> yes, I think you're right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, they they out of David, they ended up killing, I believe, all five of them. I didn't know five. Goliath had a brother. Well, he did. They talked about how four. heavy a spear was and how big he was. So, you know, it's funny, the, all the people of all the D words uh, became mighty men who also killed even more giants than David alone. Mm. Wow. Hey, anything you guys want to say about Abigail? I really like the story about I have, Abigail. I have, I have Abigail. 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 That's what I want to talk about. Yes. It's part okay. of the... It's, it's, this is what we talked about This is like a May, couple May weeks 19th ago. here that I'm looking we at. We talked a couple weeks this ago is like about a TV women. Show yeah, we talked about women in the Bible and yeah. how the women in She's nowadays... Smart, need to pay attention to the women in the Bible who are mentioned because there's something there that they can teach us. And hey, I what do you like, think it meant when he said that her husband was a, what did it say? A, a, a difficult man to be with or uh, what was the word that was used? Uh, fool, cool. Nabal. Yeah. And, and that he was, she uh, said you can tell from the lineage name. of Caleb. Yeah. It's an interesting little, little footnote that's put there in scripture. Yeah, why? Caleb. Interesting. Rose up, yeah. killed his brother. So there was something generationally. No, Caleb it, didn't kill his brother. Oh, not Caleb. Cain. You, you mean Cain. Cain. There you go. I'm thinking Cain. of Cain. Cain. Caleb. I, mean, that's I did wonder, though. It did there, mention right. Caleb, and I wondered why Here's it the house of that. Caleb, yeah. 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 And I, I, I saw that, and I just thought of Cain right away. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah, Tony, see if you can edit that out. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> no, don't, don't do it. <laughs> yeah. uh, but I do want to say, so we want to pay attention to what the scriptures say about the women who are noticed in the Bible. And this, they said about Abigail was that she was sensible and beautiful. Those are two good qualities. What an interesting quality to note about somebody that they're sensible. Well, he says that about Rachel and Rebecca. That's what I say about you all Sensible. Thank you, Jay. That's so kind. (laughs) <laughs> doesn't say that about Jezebel, I don't think. <laughs> no, it says she painted her eyelids though before she gets tossed out. The balcony. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah but it and says Delilah, she was sensible. It doesn't say she was beautiful either. Um, yeah, but, but she didn't I, know how the to one, nag. The one thing I noted was that he, David says, may God strike me and kill me if even one man of Nabal's house is still alive tomorrow morning. So he made this promise, vow before the Lord. May God kill me if they're alive. Then he meets Abigail, and Abigail kind of like intercedes on behalf of Nabal, her drunk. She sends him what he asked for. Her like, drunk, like, what, whatever. She sends him supplies, right? Like so, food. but it's interesting. What he made this vow. Why did the Lord not hold him to his vow? Didn't he though? He had a stroke, didn't he? No, it was his heart. David yeah. said, "May God strike me and kill." Oh, sorry, I thought you were saying Nabal said that. If even one man in his household is alive tomorrow morning, so Abigail, something that she does obviously changes the trajectory of what David does. But why did the Lord not f- fulfill David's vow to himself? Like, why? Interesting. Hmm. Because, Interesting. because, okay, okay, wait, this is just coming to me. Because if we go back to Judges 19, where it talks about, um, not Judges 19, 
At some point, the who was it that came back from battle and said, whoever comes through the door, not Judges 19, it's in oh Judges. Oh my gosh, though. you're talking about whoever, the tambourine dancer. Yeah, whoever yeah, comes through, test. he says, Lord, if you give us the victory, whoever comes through the door of my house, I will sacrifice to you. And he gets the victory. He comes home and his daughter comes out the door playing a tambourine. And it's, but the Lord, he had to sacrifice his daughter. She's the one that wandered on the mountain for a three couple, months, to three months to mourn yeah. her, to mourn her never being married. Oh, so, well, you know, I, on the podcast, you didn't listen to it, but I said, uh, yes, I was so, out of dad, you're never allowed to make a promise like that. <laughs> but, she, but the Lord held him to his vow, right? She, so he said he back? fulfilled the vow he made to the Lord. In this instance, David is saying, may God strike me and kill me if even one man is still alive tomorrow morning. Why was he not held accountable for this vow? Don't you think Abigail changed that? Like Abigail came in with discretion and wisdom and it changed the trajectory, like, you know, made him rescind the vow, <laughs> take it back. Yeah. I mean, but it's interesting what uh, David said about himself. It's almost like that fell on Nabal. Hmm. And like a transfer, like he, it's kind of ironic that he, he never he woke up. He stroke. just died. It was a heart it thing. Says, right? It says his, his heart, heart died within him, but, get but he this. didn't die until like 10 days later. Right. His heart died within him and he became like a stone. What's that about? I don't know. Why is this written in scripture? Then what it happened is after 10 days that the Lord struck Nabal. So he was directly killed by the Lord. By the Lord. Mm. Could you imagine? And he died. And when David heard that Nabal was dead, he said, blessed be the Lord. Blessed be the name. Strange response. Of the Lord. Blessed be the Lord. Like, write a song about that. <laughs> oh gosh, Blessed be the name. <laughs> That'd be a big seller, I'm sure. <laughs> and David sent, next verse, away. David sent and proposed to Abigail. <laughs> oh, blessed be the Lord. He's dead. Now I'm going to take his wife. And, now I'm going to uh, take his wife and marry him. And then, and then he notes that he also married somebody else. There were very different. They were Culture, different times, man. Back then. That would yes. never be okay with me. Kind of glad we don't live back then. But um, I do want to note that wife. Abigail intercedes for her husband. I put, I wrote down that she intercedes for a wicked man and prophesies into David's future. So she, he comes, and did she like? Would she have known that he was the giant killer? I mean, David was famous. Like, I think Would everybody kind of knew that? who he was. Because she says, even when you are chased by those who seek to kill you, your life is safe in the care of the Lord your God, secure in his treasure pouch, which is what New Living Translation says. But the lives of your enemies will disappear like stones shot from a sling. I mean, she obviously heard about Goliath. Or was she being prophetic? I think she heard Is this about an instance of a prophetic woman? Well, honestly, this is That's your homework this week. Look that up and see what you she think. She prophesies into his future. I would, I would just future. like to say, though, the song that Steve was talking about in the beginning, may, what if that like was ancient history billboard charts? People were singing that song around the town and it just made its way out, you know, and the song Speaking carried songs, the message. You should look on Spotify for Slinging a Stone, co-written by Jay Brogan. Oh, my gosh. About this very... Man. Okay, there you go. A little <laughs> shout out there. A little shout out to Jay. Hey, Rogan. by the way, while you were talking about that, <laughs> yeah. you said stone. Yeah. I was reading out of John 10. Uh, you know, just got to get, got to use the best parts of your brain right yeah. now, move back and forth. <laughs> and it says, this is a different passage now in John 10. It says, then the Jews took up stones again to stone him. So that's, that's what I was thinking about. What's with the stones everywhere? Because Jews answered him saying, for a good work, we do not stone you, but for blasphemy, because they're, they're on this again. Yeah. You're blasphemous because you... Being a man, make yourself God. Wow. That's why they're stoning him. And it says he answered, and Jesus answers them. And uh, therefore they sought again to seize him, but he escaped out of their hand. That was two days of reading. You see that. That's fascinating. It is. It is. I, I just, I love the fact that you can't touch Jesus until his time. You know, his act, his death is marked. And so even though he's been threatened, that, that serves for Christians too. Yeah. I mean, do not be afraid. If, if it's not your time, you're walking in the power of the Spirit, you're going to be protected. We have friends that go into Pakistan and places like that. I can't mention, but uh, <laughs> they go in there and they, they help people escape into better areas and take care of Christians there. And they do it undercover and everything. And and they go. this guy goes in fearlessly, he even takes his wife mm -hmm. in there. And I... I'm not at that place. I'm, I admire him greatly because, and we support him financially to get over there periodically because I think he's doing something no one would do. 
But Jesus did that. Mm-hmm. You know, he, yeah. he knew that if he's caught, in this sense, Jesus is caught, and he just escapes through the crowd twice in two different chapters. Anyway, back to Saul. Well, real quick, you made me think of something while you were talking. What is that scripture, Steve, where they talk about a stone being set in Zion that people fall upon or... Do you know what I'm talking about? I don't know the address for in it. Zion for a foundation, a stone. That they one. talk about it like it's, you know, it like it was like a prophecy about Jesus being the stone that would that people would either like fall upon or be crushed under yes. or something. And so it's really interesting that they're trying to stone him, but he's the cornerstone and the stone that's placed in Zion that people would fall on. So it's like they're fall trying Fall upon the rock or the rock will fall upon There it is. You. Thank yeah. you. So it's like yeah. they're trying to eliminate the chief cornerstone with lesser stones <laughs> or something. It's just interesting. They're trying to kill him with what he is. Yes, I agree. Yeah. I, I, and I, I'm, I'm fixated on that because I, I, because of the two chapters being back to back and it, you don't know if it's still the same group, if it's a different group, or this is just a harassing spirit that follows Jesus around. You know, the, the, the last thing I'd like to talk about, which you guys may not want to uh, is, but it's a big question. Is that you know Saul? Uh, Saul has been seeking God. Samuel has died, and Saul's trying to get hello, hello. You know nobody's answering. Uh, he he inquires of the Lord. He's greatly fearful. It says in verse six, uh, oh, in the Samuel, I don't know the exact verse here, but it says, uh, let's see. And when Saul inquired of the Lord, the Lord did not answer him either by dreams, actually you're going to like this, or by Urim, <gasps> or Come by on. the prophets. The sacred lots. So the three three ways they would hear, well, maybe four, did not answer him, so there was not a public uh, a voice, audible voice, no dream, no Urim, or prophets. Four, four things that normally they would get a response from the Lord, nothing's happening. And the Lord wasn't responding So he to gets Saul. distressed after banning all the mediums witchcrafts, all that stuff in the land. He goes to a, uh, what would you call it? Like a black market behind the scene, red light district or whatever. <laughs> he goes into a district <laughs> where things happen that you don't talk about. Yeah. And he goes in that district and he disguises himself, gets this woman, uh, this, uh, what she called the woman of, uh, Endor. Endor. Yeah. She's known Sounds as like that. An interesting story. Yeah, it comes to this woman, uh, disguised himself in other clothes, uh, two men with him. They come to a woman by night. So he's like, he's doing this on the, on the you know, on low. The DL. On the DL, yeah, down low. And he said, <laughs> please conduct a seance for me. Now, this is the only seance in the Bible. Hmm. That's why it's important. So the king now is asking for a seance and bring up for me, think about this, four things, he's, ways he's trying to hear from God. God's not that doesn't work. He's going to the devil woman. I mean, he's going to a witch. And bring up for me one I shall name to you. So he's going to tell her who it is. Then the one to say, look, you know what Saul has done and how he has cut off the... She doesn't know yet she's talking to Saul. Yeah. Right. So you know what Saul has done, how he's cut off the Mevens and the spirits of the land. Why then do you lay a snare for me to cause me to die? Like she thinks, this is a trick. She hasn't seen this guy before. You know, she doesn't know who he is. Um... And the woman, and he talks to her, and, and then he, and the woman says, whom shall I bring up to you? And he says, bring up Samuel for me. Oh, and he so, wants to talk to Samuel. Right, the prophet. Oh, yeah. Well, that makes mm-hmm. sense. Samuel. Because so, he, Samuel's dead, and he wants to inquire. And so this brings up so many questions, like, is this Samuel? Where was Samuel? You know, and, and even Samuel's response, is this God? Is this the devil? And I read a lot about it today, and... Nobody knows. So she did bring Samuel, but we don't know if it's the real Samuel. I think it's important to note that Samuel, like I remember, it said that he mourned after Saul was, the Lord was going to remove the kingdom from Saul. Mm. Like he mourned. He was very upset to the point where God told him, you need to stop mourning. Yeah, he well, he was part of the whole selection process, you know. Can you explain to me what happened though? Because I didn't read this part. Yeah, when a woman saw Samuel, so (laughs) Samuel comes up. When a woman sees Samuel... (laughs) With a, she cries with a loud voice. This this commentators would say because she's seeing something she hasn't seen before. Oh. So this makes me think that God entered into this oh evil God. situation. <laughs> what the, the enemy intended for evil, God kind of moves in. I mean, if he can if he can go to the depths of shale, it says in scripture. Yeah. 
Can he not enter into this? I know this is a real mind boggling thing. Boggling but, my but mind. She cries out because she's feeling this is, and she says, why have you deceived me? For you are Saul. So the woman spoke to Saul and knew instantly because of the, what she saw, that sorry, it was Saul. Well, you know what, what she saw made her think he was Saul. Well, you know what it sounds like? It what? sounds like revelation. Well, the, yeah, so, I, well, like, I think something about Samuel, yeah. she realized, oh, wait, she put, she it's puts like, it together. Did like, Samuel say something? Tra- it's a nonverbal transmission. Yeah, I don't he does. remember this story. Nonverbal transmission well, oh, of Ashley, truth. This is an amazing story. I know, why do and I so he says this, it? and he says, the woman spoke to Saul. This should be a title of this week's uh, what? Uh, podcast, something about this, you know. The witch at oh. Endor. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, well, well, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's what we should And what this me. means for you. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, he says, why have you just seen for yourself? And the king says to her, do not be afraid. What did you see? So Saul doesn't see it. She, she sees it alone and it freaks her out oh my and gosh, she okay. sees that he is Saul. And so she's getting like major revelation. Now, what do you see? And the woman said to him, I saw a spirit ascending out of the earth. And he said to her, what is his form? And she said, an old man is coming up and he's covered with a mantle and see mantle. They're, they're wondering like, wait, is this a, like, a, I've read the commentaries. Many of them think, well, that was a, a demonic version to fool them or so it's not really Samuel. What would Samuel, how would a witch be able to call Samuel up out of his, his place? It only come and Saul perceived it was Samuel. So Saul's thinking that's, that's Samuel. He's got, that's his mantle. Yep. That's he's not seeing this, but he's going by her report. And he stooped with his face to the ground and bowed down. And then it says this in scripture. Now Samuel said to Saul. So it sounds like the Bible is affirming that it was Samuel. Well, you know, there's another like reference you can use in scripture for this. I, w- I wish we could put I Ashley's have, face on the podcast. Well, there's another reference for <laughs> right now. We should post a picture. Wow. <laughs> Jesus talking about um Did Lazarus, Samuel Lazarus. say anything? He didn't say anything? Yes, he does. I haven't got that far yet, but oh, go okay, ahead, Jen. You revelators, listen. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, Lazarus, you know, remember he he died in the rich man, that whole parable that they were talking about. And there was communication yeah. between the bo- Abraham's bosom and, and how, paradise. Right. May, is it possible? I mean, you can't prove this, but like Abraham's bosom, Steve, was that physically in the earth? Like, did they believe that like... I don't know. There was a great chasm. Know. There was a great yeah, chasm was a great between... Chasm. Is it different now Like that Jesus came in like the new covenant? Like maybe they actually could call them up out of the earth because that's where Abraham's bosom was physically located? Well, if they were able to talk to back and forth to... You know, but there was a great chasm the, between the The two. rich man yeah. and Lazarus. I mean... It, I, I don't know. It seems like the rules. I don't know, were but right now it it's start in my mind. It's starting to appear that this is Samuel. It, I, that's right. And I then think. so the details of how yeah. Samuel got involved in a seance. Obviously, seance is wrong. Though you, if you don't hear it's from God, crap. don't go to seance because no. this is only mentioned once, mentioned once in the Bible. And actually, the man who received from it died shortly after that. Oh, so this yeah, is like the last day. So <laughs> yeah. So was this the right way to go? But anyway, Samuel said to Saul. You ready to this? Mm-hmm. Why have you disturbed me by bringing me So at up? this point, could Saul see him then? Because it said Saul he could, could not. hear him, I guess. Yeah, because okay. he said it to him because Saul answers. Okay, and says. So he's I mean, he's either seeing or just getting that. He's out. getting audio only. I don't know. I am deeply distressed, is what Saul says, for the Philistines. So he he's not shocked that a that a, a soul coming up from, from somewhere else is talking to him. Maybe because like, he I'd was be so like, demonized. Oh my gosh. Instead... I mean, that's he point. says, I'm deeply distressed for the Philistines. He makes his case to, the, to Samuel, make war against me. And God has departed from me and does not answer me anymore. Neither my prophets nor my dreams. Therefore, I have called you that you may reveal to me what I should do. And so Samuel says, so this is re- his report back. So why do you ask me, seeing that the Lord has departed from you and has become your enemy? <laughs> that's not a good FaceTime call. Like that's, oh, no. that's not the answer you're looking for. No. And so he's saying basically like, <laughs> You, Maybe you've is, sought four times and you haven't is heard. This we should do on future podcasts. <laughs> no, this Just is, read it to me in real time <laughs> and get my reaction. If you haven't heard in four different ways from God, wow. why are you calling me up? Which <laughs> also sounds like a little bit like Samuel. I mean, it sounds like that's something he might say. Yeah, what? FaceTime call to hell. 
<laughs> there well, you go. That's the title. Because, uh, well, not hell, because he wasn't in no, hell. No, yeah, was it? FaceTime, FaceTime to, to Abraham's to bosom. bosom. <laughs> that sounds weird. <laughs> no, that's no, weird. Don't, yeah. don't do that. Yeah, yeah, well, so, <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, uh, uh, he prophesies <laughs> over him. He says this, actually. This, this is Samuel. He's not done. And the Lord has done for himself as he spoke by me. For the Lord has torn the kingdom out of your hand and given it to your neighbor, David. This sounds like something Samuel would know. Yeah. Uh-huh. Because you did He's not repeating. obey the voice of your God, nor execute his his fierce wrath. So, hey, if you want to go to a median to hear from God, these are the kind of things you're going to hear. scary to hear that. He's done the thing to this day. Moreover, the Lord also will deliver Israel, so the whole country is going to pay for this, with you into the hands of the Philistines. And tomorrow, you and your sons will perish, will be with me. (gasps) No way. Why have I never read this story? I read the The Bible last year. So does that mean that Saul (laughs) went to heaven? Or paradise, or the bosom of Abraham. Or maybe I read it and didn't understand. Come on, Jay. What? What you're, are you saying? You've taken. You'll be with a me. Seminary class. <laughs> oh no, because he said you'll be with me. I've taken one. Yes, that's what I'm saying. You'll be with me. Oh, tomorrow. So the better question is Samuel. Does he just mean? Does he just foresee? mean you'll be toast like me? Well, or does if, he mean if, you'll if be with me at Abraham's Samuel from bosom? hell. <gasps> if it's a fake Samuel, like that'd be the question. I go, where, where, where are you hell? from? If it is Wait, a fake Samuel, is then yes, hell I have would a question. be the place. He should have had the, a security the Lord will question deliver, to ask Samuel. The Lord will deliver the army Samuel. of Israel into <laughs> the hands of the Philistines. What happened? Immediately, Saul fell full length on the ground. I can imagine. And was dreadfully afraid because of the words of Samuel. See, Scripture continues to refer him to as Samuel, not as a spirit that came out of the Now, why wouldn't the, the Scripture ground? just say that it wasn't Samuel right. if it wasn't well, a fake Samuel? Yeah, like a deceiving Samuel. <laughs> well, when everyone died, did they all go to Abraham's bosom? Maybe there wasn't enough room. Until the time of Jesus know. dying on the cross? Can I or? say something interesting here? That word is remarkably similar to the ones that Samuel gave Saul when he was alive. And oh, yeah. Like, and it's, he didn't it's listen. It's like he's repeating it. It's like he didn't listen when he was alive, but now that he's dead, it's like that's when it hits home, when it's too late. And the, When a dead man prophesies the same thing over you twice. Yeah. That's bad. That's not good. Mm. I have so much to think about. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, this is one of the big questions that Christians, have, as they're reading through this, so I thought we should address it. I don't like it because it's very awkward and uncomfortable, and I don't even like making conclusions about it because we really don't, we know. don't know. Yeah, and it is split. When you look at commentaries uh, from ones I read, half go with this was a demonic thing; it was a spirit that was. But the Lord used it. Because how could a median call out Samuel? Uh, we don't know. I, I mean, well, I don't know. You had the fortune telling demon possessed girl in the New Testament who knew things that were true. Prophesying about Paul, right? Like you, these guys are. If the, here. if the Lord uses a donkey, yeah, would He use a median? Because she screams too, like she screams in a loud voice. Oh my gosh, like what she's happened? She's never seen this before, right? So she, this isn't her typical seance. She's freaked out. Samuel's freaked out. I'm freaked and Saul's out. Tick. I, I think I'm he's, freaked I, out. No, no, Saul's freaked out, and Samuel's tick. <laughs> I think he he can hijack calls. Sure, he can go through a different route if he wants to. God could hijack something meant that the enemy uses and use it for his own purposes. Don't you think? But like what does it mean you'll and, be and with he, me? Does that just mean you'll be dead? Like what if the because medium, I'm dead? Or know, does it mean you'll medium, be with me in the place I'm in? I, I mean, guess it depends on what you think about the grace of God. <gasps> what if the medium had never really actually had any, what if she was a fake medium? Like she never actually saw something real and then this popped up. <laughs> <laughs> She's like, wow, well, it finally worked. Well, you don't <laughs> go to a medium. <laughs> <It worked>. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't like it. <laughs> I quit. I do this again. I quit. <laughs> Oops, I got the wrong place. I'm not the witch I pulled out of Abraham's bosom. <laughs> oh my. Hey, you got some thoughts on this. That's why we have the flourish page. Please <laughs> yeah. please go on there and make your comments. And we would I do love to hear I do it. have a final of final things. Let's oh end with Jesus. And uh I love the Mary Martha thing and the raising of Lazarus from the dead because um you know, we always give Martha such a bad rap in this. So I read it over yeah. carefully again. And uh, I was reminded myself that Martha is the uh, first one to run out to Jesus. And she runs out and she says to people, go, yeah, she runs out and says, uh, you know, where were you if you'd have been here? here. Right. Mm -hmm. They they forget to mention Mary said the exact same thing. That's true. But they, but Mary. Yeah, but Jesus wanted to eat at Martha's house. Yeah, she made good sandwiches. (laughs) Yeah, she did. That was (laughs) Yeah, Mary says, Lord, if you'd been here, my brother would not have died. And then Jerry, I think the second time, like he's been, he's been with Martha and Mary a lot. He loves them dearly. Yeah. He loves Lazarus. 
And the second time, it's like, it's the humani- humanity weight upon Christ. These two women that he loves are saying, where were you? I mean, anytime a woman says, this is the, the mm-hmm. most important time of my life and you weren't here, you're in trouble. And so he says that, and you know what he says? He, he said, uh, when he saw her weeping, the shortest verse in the Bible comes he's up here. Swept. He groaned in his spirit and was troubled. So all of a sudden he's, uh, uh, he's been confronted by two women and it says, and the Lord came and they said to him, Lord, come and see. And Jesus wept. And the Jews said, oh, how he loved him. So we don't know what he was weeping for. He was weeping Lazarus' death. Was he weeping because he saw how it affected the women? I think he was he weeping Lazarus. because they didn't Weren't have faith. Friends and or what, was he weeping because like did he know walking up to Lazarus's grave? Did he have like a a pre release that he was going to raise him from the dead? Maybe he didn't the Holy Spirit had moved and told him that he was going to do that yet. Maybe he was mourning the death and then walking this into what it. Well, it says yeah. that even in the next verse, so he's groaning, then he weeps, and then he groans again. It says then Jesus again groaning himself came to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone was against it. He said, "Take the stone away." Martha, the sister of him who was dead, said to him, Lord, by this time there's a stench, for he's been dead for day, four days. Yeah. Jesus said to her, did I, did I not say to you that if you would believe, you'd see the glory of God? Ugh. And of course, mm. they remove it. He cries out with a loud wow. voice, Lazarus, <laughs> come forth. And he who had died came out bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was wrapped with a cloth. That's a lot of detail. A lot of he was a mummy. You couldn't see him, and he was dead four days. Trying to kind of Jesus emphasize. said, loose him and let him go. And many of the Jews who came to Mary had seen the things that Jesus did, believed in him, but some of them went away to the Pharisees and told them the things Jesus did and and basically said, what shall we do? Because this man does signs and wonders. Verse 53, from that day on, they plotted, guess what? His to death. put him to death. Oh, my yeah. gosh. Therefore, Jesus no longer walked openly among the Jews. So. Do you- Three chapters. Yeah. Try to stone him. Try to stone him. Now they're saying, okay, we need a plan. This is it. Mm. Do you think this is what Isaiah was referencing when he said he was a man of sorrows acquainted with grief? Absolutely. I think that so. This, yeah. That this kind of is like a, a fulfillment mm. of that to showing you that he, I think it's important that we understand that Jesus was Why did human. he groan? <laughs> Ashley, think about it. The rest of scripture. Why would he groan? I don't know. I think, um, why would he groan? I don't know, for some reason, when I think of it, I think of childbirth, and mm. it's like instantly what I think of is childbirth. What kind about of... the groaning where the sons of God would come forth? Oh, yeah. yeah. Maybe maybe he's groaning. I mean, he's bringing a son of God forth. Yeah. Lazarus out of the tomb, but but longing for the day that resurrection is not necessary. Wow. He's also a present God. Maybe he's groaning because in that moment, even if healing was on the way, he empathizes and, and he identifies with our pain. He feels the grief. Maybe he thinks about his death. Yeah. maybe That's coming. Yeah. yeah. You know, and the loss and the separation and, the, and they think this is bad. Well, I just think if How's they Mary were Martha friends, you could well, imagine yeah. maybe mm-hmm. his, he's human. So hearing his friend that's, died and that's then true. you have his two other close friends saying if you would have been here this wouldn't have happened right and maybe there was something in him that felt that grief of like oh i wasn't here well you martha know? didn't like, make I him cry know. but mary did yeah that's i true. think it was just a build up like oh my gosh you know i yeah i i was here he was late he got occupied along the way yeah and they said if you'd have been here sooner he wouldn't have died and maybe there was something in the grief that he mm. felt that and then jesus said i am the resurrection and the life Oh, well, talk let's about conclude. a mic truck. <laughs> <laughs> let's conclude on that. <laughs> if you uh, wonder who the witch of Endor is and was that really Samuel? I am the resurrection and the life. Not you, Jesus. If you're wondering about <laughs> Saul and all that happened in his life and Samuel, I am the resurrection and the life. It's all you need to know. <laughs> and so let's end this now on a high note that Jesus is the resurrection of life. Whatever you're going through in your life, whatever challenges are there, how many of our days you've missed reading your scriptures. Shh. Start where you are right now. <laughs> Don't be condemned. I'm only a few days behind. Jesus okay. says, I am the resurrection and the light. Oh and by next week, Ashley will be caught up. <laughs> hey, good to have <laughs> all of you here today. You guys want any final words there? Here's your chance. No. Went a little over today, but a lot of big stuff to talk about. It was a great week. Keep reading the word of God. God bless. Goodbye.